So the Center for Integrative Environmental Health Sciences and Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology welcomes you to our Environmental Health Sciences Series Seminar. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Cynthia Corbett. Dr. Corbett received her PhD in biology with an emphasis in neurobiology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Her postdoctoral training was completed at Tufts University, followed by Tulane University, where she worked as an NIH NRSA funded postdoctoral fellow. Dr. Corbett began her first position as an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at U of L in 2002, where she has risen up the ranks to becoming a now full professor. The focus of the Corbett lab is behavioral neuroendocrinology with a specialized interest in effects that environmental have on the central nervous system. Dr. Corbett's research is currently funded by an R15 titled prenatal cigarette smoke exposure impact on offspring gut bacterial microbiome for which Rachel Neal is the PI. Dr. Neal and Dr. Corbett's groups are collaborative in their research efforts. Today, she will be presenting results from work related to this grant. Her talk today is entitled Effects of Prenatal Cigarette Smoke Exposure and Diet on Mouse Microbiome Physiology and Anxiety-Like Behavior. And with that, I'll let Dr. Corbett take it away. Thank you, Alex. Um, so as Alex mentioned, um, all of this work has been a very collaborative project with Rachel Neal, um, who has recently moved to biology, to the biology department from public health, and we have combined labs. And so we call this the CAN lab, as in we can do it. Um, that's because it's it's me, it's Mikas Abelins Abels, um, who is a term professor in biology and also Dr. Neal. <clears throat> and I expanded the title once I realized that my anxiety like behavior part was going to take me five minutes. So um, let's see if I can. OK, great. Nothing is moving in my presentation. Let's see if we'll do it this way. There we go. So I don't have to tell this group that um, there are a lot of chemicals in cigarettes and many of them are harmful. Um, at least 70 of them are confirmed to have carcinogenic activity. But lots going on there um, that will affect vascularization, affect heart. Um, and we also know that it's probably not safe to be smoking when you're pregnant. There are effects on the pregnant person um, listed here that can include even difficulty in becoming pregnant. Um, and early uh, birth, preterm birth, and babies being born too small, um, increased incidence of infant death and some craniofacial malformations. There is evidence that needs to be tracked down, which is one reason why we're doing this, um, that there could be effects on um, affective disorders such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But knowing that it's not so great to smoke while pregnant, it still happens. And especially in the state of Kentucky and uh, West Virginia, our neighbor, those are two of the highest states with the highest incidence of smoking while pregnant. Um, as of 2019, about 15% of women in Kentucky reported smoking while pregnant at some point during their pregnancy. And given the stigma of smoking while pregnant, we can pretty safely assume that that is an underreported value. So again, we know that uh, prenatal cigarette exposure is going to lead to, can lead to preterm birth low birth weight, increased risk of things like SIDS. There's also evidence looking out into childhood and adolescence of uh, children who were exposed to cigarette smoke in the womb that there are some effects on affective behavior, as I mentioned before, um, increased uh, attentional problems and behavioral problems. Um, there is There are some previous mouse studies um, that Dr. Neal was involved in um, where they found actually decreased anxiety-like behavior 
when the mice were exposed prenatally and during lactation. So prenatally through the womb, and then of course during lactation, they themselves are in, inhaling the smoke. What we're doing with this study is we are looking at gestational exposure only, and we're measuring gut microbiome, short chain fatty acids, metabolic phenotypes. All of that uh, was really Rachel Neal's baby. I was brought into it to look at the behavioral outcomes. In this particular study, uh, we've also added on a high fat diet in adulthood because often people who were exposed to cigarette smoke in utero, at least in the West, also have a Western diet that is high fat. And so we're looking for confounding effects. So we're looking at sex specific effects of prenatal exposure to cigarette smoke and uh, changes in diet. So a little more detail, um, we take Plug positive, we're using C57 black six female mice. Uh, once they're pregnant, we expose them to either cigarette smoke uh, using marble or red cigarettes, since those were the most common uh, cigarette smoked by reproductive aged women, or ambient filtered air, which we're calling our sham group, for six hours a day from gestational day one to gestational day 19. We're using this TEEG, TE, 10 c uh, cigarette smoke producer um, that produces a two second puff on a Marlboro Red per minute. We go through about 40 cigarettes in six hours. And this model induces about a 10% decrease in birth weight, which is followed by catch up growth um, during the pre weaning period. So we keep uh, the mother on a breeder diet while she's pregnant and we continue that diet um, with the dam and her pups. We are collecting tissues throughout, but the ones I'll be talking about today um, were collected at weaning around postnatal day 19. We have some at postnatal day 50. Up until that point, everyone was still on the breeder diet. So starting at postnatal day 50, the remaining litter mates were put either on a low fat diet or a high fat diet. So we have one male and one female per litter on a low fat diet, which is 5% fat, and one male and one female per litter um, on a high fat diet, which is 20% fat. And they remained on that diet for five weeks or an addition or 12 weeks. So after five weeks, we collected some tissues. Uh, animals were about three months old at that point. Um, and then the remaining ones, we didn't always have one male and one female per litter by this point, um, but that was our goal. They uh, were put through these behavioral trials that I'll explain in a minute, and we collected their tissues at four and a half months old. So given this design, we're looking at three factors, prenatal exposure, adult diet, and sex once we get out to these points. So again, all of the microbiome stuff is really like I said, Rachel Neal's baby, but I'm reporting it so that it fits in with what I'm going to say next. So we looked at the microbiome of the cecums of offspring at weaning. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to go into the dam stuff, but we did find alpha and beta uh, diversity differences in the dams as well. They don't quite match in terms of um, phyla analysis with the differences in the offspring, but the point here is there are differences. So when we look at males and females together, we see uh, a decreased alpha diversity with the CSE group compared to the shams. And um, let me see if I can put my laser pointer here. I like that better. OK, um, but what when we separate them out into males versus females, what you see is that the main driver of this effect is differences in the females with CSE females having a much lower alpha diversity. Uh, beta diversity was also affected at weaning, but there was no sex difference. So now we jump forward to PD50, where we haven't changed the diet yet. And we again see when we put the sexes together, a decrease in alpha diversity, but by the time we get to PD50, what we see is that the primary driver of this effect 
is a difference in males. The females still have um, a trend towards a difference in observed OTs, but the main effect here is in males. So we're seeing some age and sex dependent differences. And the direction that the driver is changing um, by sex depending on age. So if we also look now at the sequel beta diversity at this PD50 point, <clears throat> what we see is, again, we've got um, a very strong effect of CSE here in the red compared to the green shams. And if we separate them by sex, again, here you see that the, the males are the primary drivers of this effect. Um, looking at phylum analysis, um, there are a couple of different groups responsible, but one thing we see is a trend towards a decrease in clostridia. Um, that's important because these are acetate producers. So as I mentioned, all of the microbiome stuff is is really what what Rachel had the most. Um, uh, Rachel did all that, um, but I mention it because of the connection to acetate production. And here's where I started really getting excited as an endocrinologist. So acetate is a short chain fatty acid. It's produced by the microbes in the gut. It is a product of fermentation of carbohydrates from the diet. And acetate can work multiple ways. So it can enter cells, it's small, and it also has facilitated transport to get into cells. So it's a source of acetyl-CoA for the TCA cycle. It can promote protein acetylation and it activates uh, the AMPK pathway in the liver, which is very important for metabolic processing. Um, it also has G protein coupled receptors. So on the pancreas, those receptors can help regulate insulin secretion. And it has direct, uh, that's a direct action on insulin secretion. It has an indirect action on insulin through its stimulation of a glucagon-like peptide from the gut. Glucagon-like peptide is an incretin, so it is usually released in response to food hitting the gut, particularly glucose, and it acts at the pancreas as an incretin to further stimulate insulin secretion. Um, it also, acetate, has uh, some effect on stimulating leptin at adipocytes. So there's a lot of endocrine stuff going on here, which got me excited, and metabolic processing related actions of acetate. So why do I mention all this? Well, in our PD-50 animals, we found that there was, even in the sham animals, a sex difference in acetate uh, in the cecum, and that when you add uh, cigarette smoke exposure to that, that you reduce acetate production in the males to make them look more female-like. Um, and all of these three, the differential letters indicate significant difference. So the CSE females are intermediate between there. So if anything, it's increasing it in the females and decreasing it in the males. So here is where the microbiome um, differences are showing up physiologically in terms of acetate availability, at least in the cecum. So looking at um, the three months old, so this is once they have been on that diet challenge for five weeks, what we see, let me orient you a little bit. So we're starting with uh, sham, I'm sorry, uh, Males in green, female, uh, what am I doing? Sorry, low fat in green, high fat in red, males and females. Here we have some DEXA scan data on percent tissue fat. And what we're seeing when we look at our three-way ANOVA is lots of effects. So we see there is a diet effect, there is a separate sex effect. So the diet effect is basically driven by uh, high fat diet in the males, both sham and CSE, compared to the low fat diet. 
Um, and then there is an overall sex differences of males being fatter than females. We also have some exposure effects. Um, the overall exposure effect is not quite significant, but the exposure by diet effect interaction is. And a lot of that is driven here by CSC increasing fat in the females um, on a high fat diet compared to sham. Now, the males gained fat a lot faster on the high fat diet than the females did. And we suspect that if we had done this maybe after about two weeks on the high fat diet instead of five weeks, we might have caught um, an exposure difference in the males as well, but now we don't know. Um, and then we look at fasting plasma insulin. And again, what we see is there are sex effects, diet effects, interactions all over the place. But mainly one thing that should stand out is that the females have a lot more variability on the high fat diet than on the low fat diet. And that females on the high fat diet and cigarette smoke exposure um, are have elevated insulin uh, compared to the other groups. So um, I should have mentioned this is fasting plasma insulin. So you really uh, shouldn't be seeing insulin increasing when the animals haven't eaten for four hours. So we see some potential dysregulation of insulin signaling in the females um, compared to the males. At four months of age, um, we see some glucose intolerance. So we have glucose tolerance testing here. Here are the curves over time, and here's the area under the curve down here. And what we see is an effect of gestational uh, CSE. So in every case, we see that the CSE animals, regardless of diet, have um, higher blood glucose over time than their sham counterparts. And here we're looking at fasting blood glucose um, where we have interaction effects. Um, we have an exposure effect, a sex effect, and a sex by diet effect. And so here what we're seeing is in the low fat groups, an increase with CSE on blood glucose in the males, um, but not on the high fat diet. Whereas the females, you get the same pattern regardless of high fat versus low fat. Um, so lots of interesting interactions going on here that we still need to um, follow up with at later dates. But don't have that data. <laughs> so, but what we're looking at so far is that um, we've got the effect of cigarette smoke can depend on sex, it can depend on diet, and as well, the effect of diet depends on sex. Moving on to what I said I was going to talk about, um, we have several assays for anxiety-like behavior in mice. And again, this is at the about four months point, um, and then we took tissues at four and a half months. So we did uh, elevated plus maze, which is shown here. I don't know if you can tell because it's a black mouse on a black maze. I used to use white mice. That's why my maze is black. But um, these two sides are open, and this maze is raised uh, 50 centimeters off the floor. And so when the animal is in the open side, it can look over the edge and it's a little scary. Whereas these sides from the upper camera view, you can't tell, but these have very high arms. Uh, these are closed arms. So this is a much safer place to be for a mouse. And we are, uh, looking to see how much time they spend in the open arm versus the closed arm and how many times they enter the different arms. The light dark box, I'm only showing you the light side, but this box has a light shining over um, an open side. There is a small hole that the mouse can go into to go to a covered dark side, which is a much safer place to be. So when an animal is 
in the dark side more, that is an indication of more anxiety like behavior on their part, whereas when they come out and explore the light side, they're a bit braver. We start them off in the light side. We measure what is the latency to enter the dark side and then how many times do they cross and how much time, what duration do they spend in the dark side versus the light. Marble burying, um, we have 16 marbles placed on top of a pretty thick layer of bedding. We give the animal time in there and the more anxiety-like behavior here is to bury the marbles because they're a novel thing that uh, should induce some anxiety. And then we have neohypophagia, and that is where um, animals are given sweet corn, which should be a yummy treat. Uh, we measure how long it takes them to eat it in their home cage versus a novel cage, um, and then the total amount consumed, whereas having the corn in a novel environment, the novel environment should be anxiety inducing. And if they are more anxious, they will take longer to eat it and they will eat less. So uh, we found no differences in the elevated plus maze in terms of frequency or duration of arm entries. So uh, just showing this briefly, just so you see that um, the, the blue are the cigarette exposed animals, the green are the sham animals, and there's no difference in terms of how many times they entered the different arms, open, middle, and closed, and how long they spent there. When we look at the light dark box, um, we found no differences in frequency uh, of entries latency to enter the dark or duration of dark entries due to exposure. Now this is, these p-values are from a one-way ANOVA that our undergraduate student, uh, Megan Kynard Hobner did, um, but there, you know, some kind of trend happening here. So we followed this up with um, three-way ANOVA, which is presented a little bit differently, so I'll orient you to this. So, uh, what this is showing is males on top, females on bottom, low fat diet on the left, high fat diet on the right, shams in green, CSEs in gold. And the means are little black triangles, which I think are hard to see. But the take home here is that we had no uh, exposure effects, but we did have sex and diet effects in that males were more, were spending more time in the dark than females, um, and low fat groups were spending more time in the dark than uh, overall, than high fat groups. And again, it was, we already know that in general, in mouse studies, that males tend to show more anxiety-like behavior than females. Um, and we also have seen in the literature that um, high fat diets can be um, anxiety, anxiety lytic, so can reduce anxiety compared to low fat diets. Part of kind of the hedonic value of having a high fat food. All right, but no exposure effects. When we look at marble bur bur burying, um, we're looking for um, if, again, if they are finding this novel exposure anxiety inducing, the idea is that they will tend to try to get rid of it. They will bury it. They'll move it around. We did not find any differences in the number of marbles moved, um, but we did find a diet by exposure interaction in terms of number of marbles buried. And so what we're seeing here is that in sham mice of both sexes, the low fat diet groups buried more marbles than did the high fat diet groups. And this again goes with, you know, high fat diet being anxiety reducing. Um, however, we did not see this effect in the CSE groups. Okay, so what we're seeing is uh, the effect of diet depends on exposure. 
Then in the neohypophagia, so again, the mice were provided uh, the, the thawed frozen corn. They were uh, exposed to it early to learn that frozen corn is good. Then they were given a trial in their home cage. And then again in a novel cage and the amount eaten was recorded. And so what I'm showing here is the difference in the food consumed uh, novel minus home environment. So if there's no difference, they'll be at zero. Um, which somehow that line got moved up a bit. Anyway, uh, we did find an exposure effect. So what you see is all of the cigarette smoke animals are on the left and they are eating less in the novel cage than in the home cage, which is an indication of anxiety like behavior, whereas you do not see that happening in the sham groups. So we followed this up uh, by taking the brains of these animals and dissecting out the uh, hypothalamus. Um, because we found this effect in neohypophagia, we know that neohypophagia effects are linked to hippocampus, amygdala, and hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is the easiest of those to dissect out, and that's what we have RNA-seq data on, thanks to an Embray NextGen pilot grant. And we were looking again at prenatal exposure, postnatal diet, and sex, and we found effects, of course, lots going on in there um, in our RNA-seq data. So I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on the various genes, but I'm just going to show you some of the spread patterns in these volcano plots. So here what I'm showing you is males on the left, females on the right. So again, with all looking at RNA-seq data, it's hard to do uh, all three factors at once. So what we did is we collapsed and looked at two factors at a time and to look for statistical differences. Uh, the pink is where the, the p value is less than 0.05 and the red is the q value is less than 0.05 as well. So um, what I'm showing you here is that there are many genes that have um, differences of exposure. So here what we're looking at is the difference of cigarette versus sham within males. And here we have cigarette versus sham within females. So effective exposure within sex. Here I'm looking at effective diet within sex. So high fat versus low fat within males, high fat versus low fat within females. Up, oh, we can look at effective sex within exposure. So male versus female in CSE animals, male versus female in sham. And here we have effective diet within exposure. So high fat versus low fat within CSE, high fat versus low fat within sham. And here we have within diet, male versus female in low fat, male versus female within high fat, cigarette versus sham within low fat, cigarette versus sham within high fat. So everywhere we're seeing lots of different effects, um, including effects of exposure on gene expression in the hypothalamus um, at four and a half months of age when the exposure was during the prenatal period. So to summarize all of that, um, we have found that prenatal CSE alters gut microbiome in an age and sex dependent manner. It lowers microbial acetate production in the cecums of males to make them more female-like. It alters percent body fat, hepatic gene expression, which I didn't think I had time to show, um, glucose tolerance and insulin in a sex-dependent manner. It affects some anxiety-like behaviors and not others, but depending on the behavior, the, the effect changes. So it decreases anxiety in the marble burrowing test increases it in the neohypophagia test. And it alters expression of hypothalamic genes in a sex-dependent manner. What's next? Well, we still have a lot of tissues that we've collected at lots of ages through the study that we still need to analyze for gene expression and uh, Western blots for proteins. Um, we've done some of that. I didn't think I had time to show it. Um, and we are still following up that RNA-seq data with pathway analysis, for example, Metacore, um, getting help from the 
genomic score and KBRIN on that. And um, based on all of this data that we have so far, um, we have just been awarded a continuation, a renewal of the NIH R15 that funded all of that. And so what we want to do is determine if these changes in microbiome we see are causative of the differences in physiology and behavior. So we know we have differences in microbiome. We know we have some differences in physiology and behavior, but we don't know if these are directly linked. So what we want to do is do sequel transfers. So we will take the same idea, six hours per day, prenatal exposure, uh, let them get through weaning, and then take CSE, cecum, transfer it to sham animals, to see if it's the microbiome that can make a difference in the absence of cigarette smoke exposure, and then take the sham uh, cecums and transfer to CSE animals to see if we can induce a CSE-like phenotype in, uh, I'm sorry, if we, can in, if we can resolve the CSE phenotype by giving them a sham microbiome. And then we're also following up that short chain fatty acid story by giving the animals uh, resistant starch that will modify the short chain fatty acid production to see how that affects the phenotype and the outcomes in the CSE versus the sham animals. So we're setting ourselves up for a lot of work over the next couple of years, um, but I'm really eager to get going. The grant was just awarded last month, so we're still ramping up on that. Um, I put this at the end just in case I had time to go over it. It looks like I do. But just to, since uh, many of you might not know who we are and what we do, um, here are some of the other things that we've been doing in the CAN lab. Um, this one is done, but um, looking at social dance and post-traumatic stress disorder with Deborah Denenfeld pictured here, who is the founder and director of Dancing Well, the Soldier Project, which looks to see if social dance can increase wellness in veterans with PTSD and their loved ones who care for them. And we did a, a small study on that and found that actually, yes, that our measures of wellness did improve after a 10-week uh, social dance experience. And really what's going on there is not just the movement itself, but the sense of community and belonging and um, having someone notice if you don't come, for example, and give a phone call. So this is a very, uh, this project is still going on. The, the program is still going on here in Louisville and is expanding. Um, Deborah is training other people around the country to continue her program elsewhere. Um, a study that was done a little bit ago, uh, looking at prenatal valproic acid, um, which is the brand name Depakote. It's an anticonvulsant that people with uh, seizures would take, um, but it is also a model for inducing autism in mice or autistic-like uh, behavior in mice. The idea here being that we know that autism is, you're at a higher risk of having an autistic child if you take valproic acid during pregnancy. We know that males are more uh, likely to be diagnosed with autism. We wanted to see if in a mouse model of autism, if we could affect the autistic-like behaviors by giving testosterone to the females. And uh, again, that's just an overview, but we did find that, um, that the more hits that you have, valproic acid, testosterone, and maleness, the more likely we found autistic-like behavior in the mice. Um, working with Kira Taylor and a former student of mine, Monica Unseld, um, there's a project on tear gas, given all of the tear gas uh, emissions that were seen back in 2020, and looking at menstrual cyclicity. And Kira has really taken off with that and done cool things with it. Um, and then there's the Avalon's Abels part of the CAN lab, which is Mikas Avalon's Abels, uh, who is looking at songbird nest parasitism, stress, parental care. He has now got a new project with the Envirome um, Center and looking in the Greenheart study, looking at songbirds 
as a proxy for uh, pollution in the urban environment. Um, kind of the, the robin in the coal mine, if you will. He studies robins. Um, Rachel Neal and I and all of our students uh, funded by a CIHS pilot grant have been spending the summer taking the cigarette model and applying it to uh, vaping. And so that's what we've been busy with all summer and we'll continue with um, all those tissues. And hopefully Rachel will get a chance to tell you what she found and what we found with the vaping once we get all of that together. And then of course the cigarette smoke stuff uh, has been what we've been doing for the past few years. So anyway, that's an overview of what's going on over in the Department of Biology in the Khan Lab. And uh, if you see any uh, opportunities for uh, collaboration, we'd love to hear from you. So here is a list of several of the people that have been involved in this. Um, our mm. current students, um, former students who were involved in this particular project, I particularly want to point out uh, Megan Kennard Hobner, who did a lot of the behavioral studies, followed up by Sophia Brown, who did the neohypophagia and marble burying stuff. Uh, Isaiah Bersiaga has been with us since he was an undergrad. He's now a PhD student in our lab. And uh, we have several uh, summer students who are with us this summer. And we also uh, now have Selma Pabuchanan, who is a graduate student, and Caitlin Chisholm, who's been working very hard with us, started as a summer student last summer and has stayed on because she's just so wonderful. Um, in case you don't know her, this is Rachel Neal and Mika Sabalin Zabels, who's doing the bird work. I also want to, of course, uh, point out our funding sources. Uh, Cabrin, um, which is now Embre, that did the uh, RNA-seq pilot. Um, NIH that uh, funds our R15, and then also CIEHS, um, who is currently funding the vaping, the vaping stuff. And that is what I have. Thank you very much. I will try to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Dr. Corbett. Dr. Corbett. There we go. Um, if everybody could just put their uh, raise their hand and I will try to field any questions that everyone has. OK, Jamie Young has a question. Go ahead, Jamie. OK, hi, uh, that was fantastic. It was really good to hear the work that you told me that you were doing um, a couple weeks ago, so it was it's amazing. Um, and there's a lot of room for collaboration, which is exciting as well. Mm -hmm. My question for you is kind of going back to the study model. So a 20 percent fat diet does not seem remarkably high to me compared to the Western diets that are used by other labs. Usually it's around 42 percent. Um, so I was kind of wondering if you could explain maybe why that type of fat diet was used and maybe you may see differences if you go with a higher fat diet that are more pronounced. So just maybe an explanation of why those diets were chosen. Um, actually, those diets were chosen before I joined the project. <laughs> uh, I should know the answer to that better than I do, but um, I think, you know, it finding differences even at that right you're right it is not a western diet which a lot of those you know you can get up into like 40 percent um but it's still a uh higher fat than what the breeder chow was right and so if we can find differences at that level right that indicates that there still is this interaction of diet in adulthood and prenatal exposure. Um, one thing I would point out though, the, um, the low fat diet is really low fat, so it's not exactly a control diet. Um, exactly. Right, and part of the issue is having enough, we, we don't have enough animals to do low control and high, right? Because we're dealing with, we start with, 
however many pups are in each litter, we call to eight, right? And then we're taking them at each age stage. And so by the time we get to where we're at day 50, we're lucky if we have, you know, a male and a female at high and at low. And, you know, so the logistics of this is really daunting. Um, and we're not actually going to repeat that in our new study. So it would be nice if we could. Um, but given that we're now going to be doing sequel transfer and have four groups for that, you know, so CSC sham, sham CCD, CSC, CSC, sham, sham, like just the logistics of adding diet into that as well was just more than we could manage. I completely understand. Um, so the other question I had, sorry, I'm looking at my notes, was the idea that you, not the idea, the results that you had greater variability in the females, I'm thinking particularly about like the insulin levels, the fasting insulin levels. I've seen that a lot with my high fat diet studies in the females yeah. in general, that there's a lot more variability. And so, you know, the statistics look a little different with the females and the males tend to be much tighter in all of the measures. So I don't have a good answer. And I was wondering if you guys had talked about that at all within within can and why that might be. Yeah, you know, um, all of those are post pubertal animals. And we did not stage for estrocycle. So, you know, that potentially we know that estrogen also affects insulin release from the pancreas. So that's a that's a, a hypothesis I could posit that, you know, that that is an estrocyclicity issue. But why more variability after cigarette smoke than in sham, which was also shown? You know, interesting. That things. would be something I would I would follow up with if I had time, money, and people. <laughs> yes, yeah, I understand. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Dr. Barnes is next. Dr. Barnes. So Cynthia, first off, great talk and congratulations on your renewal. I'm going to say that publicly. Um, so a couple of things about the um, behaviors. First off, um, those behaviors were done uh, when the mice were how old again? They were between um, three months and four and a half months. Okay, okay. The re reason why I was asking was that, um, you know, and I think uh, Jamie could speak to this a lot further. Um, one of the observations that I think we've had um, with high fat diet groups is that um, differences are um, not as pronounced perhaps at uh, three to four months as they are at six months of age. Um, Just time on diet. Yeah, and so um, so the question is, the question is um, if you tested your behaviors at six months, um, what would those what would those look like? Um, so uh, food for food for thought on that. Um, so uh, you know, in your new in your new um, uh, grant, you're going to be um, you're going to be pursuing sort of the uh, impact uh, on acetate. So, sounds like I, and you're measuring behaviors as well in that new yes. grant, is that right? Um, so and I didn't go into it, sorry to interrupt. I didn't go into a ton of detail, but we're doing, um, we're looking at things uh, after weaning, pre-pubertally, and then we're also doing it again at about day 60. So when they are reproductively mature. Okay, and uh, you guys are still gonna be measuring behaviors, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so besides the, um, I know you've looked at the hypothalamus. Um, do you plan on looking at some more, uh, you know, like attention, at, at brain regions that mediate attention, brain regions that mediate anxiety? Uh, is that in the plan? Well, Yes, one thing that I really I've learned about recently from Savina Weibel is the ability to do the um, RNA seq on a slide where you can take 
you know, a whole brain section instead of trying to dissect out regions from the whole brain and run, you know, PCR or RNA seq on it that you can do the whole section on a slide and do RNA seq with regional specificity. And so I'm it it sounds incredibly expensive and an R15 yes. might not <laughs> right. most likely cannot cover that. But if I can get supplemental funding or maybe voucher grant um, that could help with that, I haven't priced it yet. I was just mentioning talking with it uh, about it with Sabine. Um, that might okay. be a way to get Thank at. Thank you. I, I, I can't region. hear you now, so oh, <laughs> something must be wrong with my Internet. Can everyone else hear me? Yes. OK. Yes. Yes, we can all hear you. <laughs> OK, um, Alyssa, Lon. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Cynthia, for the talk today. Uh, I also had a question about the model. My question was about the um, exposure to cigarette smoke, which was a total of six hours a day. Was that <laughs> all? one exposure or was it spread out over the course of the day? That is one six hour exposure, which really equates to a whole day for us. <laughs> By the time you uh, set it up, get it going, and then you have to evacuate the chamber and clean up everything before you can do it again. So that six hour exposure is more like an eight hour day for us. Um, okay. So my next thought, like I know logistically how difficult it would be to, you know, take the animals out and put them back in and evacuate the chamber all over again uh, to spread that out over the course of the day. But if you're exposing the animals all at once for you know six hours, that's a kind of a higher dose exposure for a shorter period of time versus if it were intermittently through the day, it would be a lower exposure over the course. How do you think that's going to affect the translatability to human studies? Um, it's what we can do. So, right. um, you know, it's uh, and it's a total of, you know, 40 cigarettes <laughs> over oh, the course of those six hours because, um, but it's taking a two second puff um, every minute over the course of six hours. And, um, you know, it's over the course of six hours, which we do measure cotinine levels, which is a metabolite of nicotine. Mm -hmm. And so we are getting them to a point that is uh, on par with what a smoker would have. Um, so that's, I mean, it's basically as close as we can get with the constraints that we have. And right. you know, we can't do this 20, and I mean, we can't do this for the 16 hours or so that a, a smoker might be smoking, but. Right. Um, but we do get cotinine levels that are on par with what you want to do for this model and more importantly we get the low birth weight um, mm -hmm. phenotype that you see when pregnant women smoke all right thank you okay um andre richardson uh dr corbett how are you doing good how are you Good. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I also have a question about the exposure system itself. Um, so you said that it's an exposure of 40 cigarettes. Do you have any um, worry about survival of the animals given the amount of carbon monoxide? We, um, it is, it is mixed with air and we monitor the, the levels um, and can adjust so that we're not going over into toxic levels. And we, you know, we have okay. not seen, and we look at them behaviorally, right? So they move around, they eat, they drink, you know, they're not just completely, you know, hunkered down and, and looking sick, right? So we also, you know, use behavior as a, um, as a method to see how they're doing during the exposure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Dr. States. Hi, great talk, Cindy. Thank um, you. <clears throat> and an immense amount of work on what I know is limited funding. So yes. I'm, I'm really <laughs> impressed. Um, 
And in regard to the exposure and a human equivalent, that might be somewhat equivalent to someone, a smoker who is prohibited from smoking at work. Good answer. Okay. I wish I had said that to the one before. So you can you can tuck that one away sometime. <laughs> Use it in your grant. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. OK, um, Evelyn, I don't know how to say the last name. Gazal? Gazal? Gazal. Hi, Cindy, that was a great talk. I was a little intrigued by your acetate data. I understand you measured in fecal matter, and I see that as maybe a measure of metabolism. Are you taking that into account? in differences in metabolism between males and females, between smokers and non-smokers. Those are known values, and I was wondering if you'd take that into account. Well, one thing we're doing with the next grant um, is we're going to be, I mean, the we had just gotten the GCMS up and going, trained a student in uh, how to do the measures, and managed to get that. <laughs> So what we're doing for the next grant is we're going to be doing the same thing, but we're going to be looking at cecum for production, blood for load, and feces for elimination. Because what we want to see is how much of what is produced in the cecum makes it into the blood versus gets eliminated. And so we're trying, that is a an approach to look more at the pharmacokinetics of it, I guess you could say, or the metabolism. Uh, the metabolism of it. I would think that very simply smoking would affect their appetite, even though how much they eat. Um, we also will be measuring food intake. Um, I think there was a general overview of food intake uh, in this study, and um, honestly, I can't remember what that data said. If Rachel's on, maybe she can joke then. Um, but we'll also be adding more. Um, metabolic data, so we'll be doing, um, you know, metabolic cages um, and again, DEXA scanning and collaboration with the Di uh, Diabetes and Obesity Center. I think that's going to be very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of work. I was just looking at, you know, looking over the grant again. It's like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? <laughs> but we're going to do it. We're going to do it at least. You know, you, you are the can group, right? <laughs> We're the can. We can do it. And we have a an army of undergrads at our disposal, uh, many of whom end up sticking around for a while oh, uh, awesome. and and getting really well trained. Awesome. Thank you. OK, that's the last question that I can see. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Corbett, for your wonderful presentation today. And um, we look forward to seeing you at the <clears throat> next uh, Environmental Health Sciences Series seminar, everybody. Everybody take care. <laughs>